Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight, from calls for using the military to guard the U.S. border to attacking Amazon for costing the Postal Service money. We explore the many questions raised by President Trump's statements today. Then ethical problems muddy the waters. Growing scrutiny surrounds the head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt. Also ahead, a critical moment in the conflict in Syria. The White House signals efforts to scale back the U.S. presence while a web of opposing forces complicate peace efforts. Plus, inside Canada's educational success, how Toronto is integrating immigrant students in the classroom. I think what Canada has shown us is that you can much more equitably provide a high level of education uh, across entire provinces and even across a country. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. There has been a shooting attack today at the headquarters of YouTube. Police say that a woman opened fire at the company campus in San Bruno, California. Officers swarmed to the site, and TV images showed workers leaving buildings with their hands up and being checked. Several were taken to hospitals. We have four victims um, who have all been transported for, uh, for gunshot-related injuries, and we have one subject, um, who's uh, deceased inside the uh, building uh, with a self-inflicted wound that at this time uh, we believe to be the shooter, but we're still following up on that. And we're continuing to monitor the story. The shooting comes just days after YouTube banned videos promoting guns and gun accessories. Also tonight, the U.S. military may soon be guarding the nation's border with Mexico. President Trump raised that possibility today and warned that he could tear up a new North American free trade agreement if Mexico doesn't cooperate. Mr. Trump talked up the idea as he met with presidents of Baltic nations at the White House. So uh, we are preparing for the military to secure our border between Mexico and the United States. Uh, we have a meeting on it in a little while with General Mattis and everybody, and uh, I think that it's something we have to do. Our own Lisa Desjardins was at today's press conference, and she joins me now. So, Lisa, you've spent the day trying to talk to folks about what the president is talking about here. Judy, in total, unfortunately, we don't know what that meeting is that he's talking about. The White House staff has not gotten back to us. We've reached out to many communication staffers over there and other sources. The Department of Defense has also not responded yet to their calls. Our team also reached out to border state governors and members of Congress. None of them said they had details of this plan yet. But it was interesting. The state of Texas did respond and say that they already are using National Guard troops under state direction since 2014. They've had 1,000 state troops at the border. Now, whatever this is, the president does have the power to send National Guard troops to the border. President Obama did it in 2010. But it's interesting, Judy, reports after that showed that that was very complicated. It took at least six months or up to six months to even begin that process. So whatever he's doing, if this is a plan, it can't happen right away. And we know this has just popped up literally uh, right. within, uh, within the last day. So the president talked about a couple of other things mm -hmm. that I think is raising interest. One was a comment, Lisa, that he made about Amazon, the tech giant. Let's listen to that. The post office is losing billions of dollars and the taxpayers are paying for that money because it delivers packages for Amazon at a very below cost. And that's not fair to the United States. It's not fair to our taxpayers. And Amazon has the money to pay the fair rate at the post office, which would be much more than they're paying right now. So, Lisa, you've also been talking to folks to try to understand what it is the president has in mind. Here's what we know. The post office is losing billions of dollars, but not in package delivery. That is an area where they are actually seeing their revenues go up. Now, Amazon does have a special rate with the post office because of the very large volume that Amazon gives to the post office. We do not know what that rate is. But by law, Judy, the post office cannot charge a rate that actually causes a loss to the post office. That, that's a law right now. Now, there's even bigger context here, though, because, of course, Amazon is owned by Jeff Bezos, richest man in America and the owner of the Washington Post. The president has obviously lashed out at media companies before. But interestingly enough, Judy, there's a problem with big business here. We haven't seen a president 
be this critical of a successful American business in this way. And the Chamber of Commerce actually sent us a statement late today saying it is inappropriate for government, government officials to use their position to attack an American company. That is remarkable coming hmm. from the generally Republican pro-business Chamber of Commerce talking about a Republican president. Which generally has been favorable to the president. Well, we know yeah. the president has been critical of the Washington Post reporting. So finally, Lisa, another thing the president brought up today, which is raising questions, and that is his relationship with Vladimir Putin, the leader of Russia. Here's what he said. There's nobody been tougher on Russia. And with that being said, I think I could have a very good relationship with President Putin. I think. It's possible I won't, and you will know about it. So I think I could have a very good relationship with Russia and with President Putin. And if I did, that would be a great thing. And there's also a great possibility that that won't happen. Who knows? So, Lisa, this comes after just a whole lot has been happening in the relationship between the Especially U.S. Especially news from the Kremlin and the White House yesterday that the president and Vladimir Putin talked about meeting sometime in the not-too-distant future. We don't have any more details of that. Judy, in that room, it was so fascinating during that moment to watch the uh, Estonian president in particular, who has a long border with Russia, stone-faced. She's someone who does not think it's a good idea to be friendly with Russia. Uh, oh, as we said, uh, in the middle of just so much going on between yeah. uh, the United States uh, and Russia, not to mention the investigation. Lisa Desjardins, thank you very much. You're welcome. In the day's other news, Russia moved to forging even closer ties with NATO member Turkey today. In Ankara, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, met with Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan. They approved plans for Russia to build Turkey's first nuclear power plant. The Turks already agreed to buy a long-range missile defense system from Moscow. The United States formally proposed 25 percent tariffs this evening on $50 billion worth of Chinese goods. It's part of a plan to punish Beijing for alleged technology theft. The list ranges from aerospace to chemicals to motorcycles. In France, high-speed trains stood still today as a series of strikes began against the national rail system. Workers are protesting President Emmanuel Macron's plan to trim benefits that date back to the 1930s, including guaranteed jobs for life. In Paris, stations were packed this morning, and commuters complained of crowding on the slower trains that were running. This is really catastrophic. Something needs to be done. We're the victims. We haven't done anything. We need to get to work like everyone else. You should have seen what happened on the train. Some people felt unwell. Women were crying. Children. This isn't normal. Meanwhile, hundreds of rail workers and their supporters marched in the streets of Paris. They plan to strike a total of 36 days over the next three months. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reversed himself today and canceled a deal to move and resettle some 16,000 African migrants from Israel to Western nations. Another 20,000 would have remained in Israel, but Netanyahu's conservative supporters rebelled against that plan after it was announced. Most of the migrants are from Eritrea and Somalia. Back in this country, 17 states, the District of Columbia, and six cities are suing the Trump administration over adding a citizenship question to the 2020 census. The question has not been asked in 70 years. New York's Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, along with lawmakers and civil rights groups, called it an affront to the Constitution. This is really just an effort to punish places like New York that welcome immigrants, that are accommodating to immigrants, right. and embrace the American tradition of open arms for all. So we stand to lose money because this determines congressional representation and the Electoral College. We stand to lose political representation. The state of California filed a separate lawsuit last week. Striking teachers closed a number of school districts across Oklahoma for a second day. Thousands of educators and their supporters descended on the state capitol. They are demanding increased funding for public schools. The state's largest teachers union says that the walkout will continue tomorrow. President Trump is again defending the conservative Sinclair Broadcast Group. The company has been criticized for having its news anchors read a message that voices concern about fake news. Today, Mr. Trump tweeted, 
The fake news networks, those that knowingly have a sick and biased agenda, are worried about the competition and quality of Sinclair Broadcast. Sinclair is one of the country's largest broadcast chains, owning nearly 200 TV stations. Wall Street battled back today and recouped some of Monday's losses. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 389 points to close at 24,033. The Nasdaq rose 71 points and the S&P 500 added 32. And Villanova University celebrated today as its men's basketball team returned home to Philadelphia as national champions. The Wildcats claimed the title last night, beating Michigan 79-62. to It is their second title in three years. Congratulations. Still to come on the news hour, the head of the EPA under scrutiny. What's next for a war-torn Syria and the U.S. role there? Plus, much more. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt has arguably had as much influence and impact as any other member of the president's cabinet, especially when it comes to rolling back regulations and reversing policy enacted by the Obama administration. But as William Brangham reports, the controversies and ethical questions around Pruitt are accumulating. That's right, Judy. The most recent controversy is about what some are calling a sweetheart real estate deal. Last week, ABC News reported that Pruitt was occasionally renting a room in Washington, D.C. for $50 a night from the wife of a lobbyist for the energy industry. That lobbyist and his firm said they were not lobbying the EPA at the time, and the EPA said the arrangement was not a conflict. But the New York Times reported today that a Canadian client of that lobbying firm, Enbridge Inc., got a sign-off from the EPA during this period to expand a major oil pipeline. Administrator Pruitt has also come under scrutiny for expensive charter and first-class travels during his first year. Eric Lipton has been reporting on Scott Pruitt's tenure at the EPA for the New York Times, and he broke the most recent story about Enbridge's pipeline. And Kathleen Clark teaches government ethics at Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Eric Lipton, first off, Thanks. before we get to the pipeline deal, can you just explain a little bit more about the housing arrangement that Scott Pruitt had? What was going on there? Sure. So he comes to uh, Washington having lived in Oklahoma, where he was serving the, as the attorney general. He's not lived in Washington full time before. And he uh, was looking for a place to live. And uh, he through, he knew the, the chairman of this lobbying firm because he had an Oklahoma tie. And somehow or other, he ends up getting an arrangement where he's going to rent a room in this condo for $50 a night and only has to pay on the nights that he's there. That, if you look around the neighborhood in Capitol Hill, that's significantly less than it typically would cost uh, to get either a, a, an Airbnb room or even if you get, multiply that times 30, what it would be for an apartment. So it, it seems like it was a pretty attractive deal. And the issue is that that same lobbying firm has a whole host of clients that with issues before the EPA. Oklahoma Gas and Electric, Colonial Pipeline, ExxonMobil, uh, Enbridge, which is a pipeline, another pipeline company, um, Conchero, you know, oil and gas company. So he's renting a, a unit from a, at the same time as the husband is the chairman of a company that has a bunch of business before the EPA. So Kathleen Clark, what do you make of this? The head of the EPA renting a room from a lobbying firm tied to the industry that he's ostensibly regulating. Uh, the EPA says this was not a conflict. They said he was, in essence, paying market rent for this. What are the implications here? So federal employees are prohibited from accepting a gift, including a discount from any, anyone with a matter before the agency that they work for. Um, and uh, in addition to that, all presidential appointees are prohibited from accepting gifts from registered lobbyists. It appears that Pruitt, uh, the EPA head, may have violated both of those ethics provisions. So the idea being that if you get a room or a rental agreement that is well below market value, that's really me as an industry that's lobbying, giving you, uh, Pruitt, the gift. That's right. The difference between the market rate and the, the rate that Pruitt paid would be considered a gift under the gift standards. Understood. Uh, Eric, you're the one, as I mentioned, that broke this story about the pipeline uh, that Enbridge Inc. got. Uh, they got a waiver from the EPA while Pruitt was renting this room. Can you tell us a little bit more about that situation? 
Yeah, I mean, what the EPA did was to tell the State Department, which has the power to issue what's called a presidential permit, because this was a pipeline that was going to cross the international line between Canada and the United States. The EPA told the State Department that it did not have serious environmental objections to that pipeline expansion. And that occurred in March of 2017, at the same time that Pruitt was living in the unit. And Enbridge is represented by Williams and Jensen, the lobbying firm, um, and who, you know, that had the ties to the apartment. So we don't have any evidence that Pruitt intervened or that, um, or that, you know, Williams and Jensen asked for any favor. And in fact, Williams and Jensen asserts that it was not lobbying the EPA on this matter. But the problem is, is that, you know, the, the standard is that you, you should not even take any action that creates an appearance of a conflict of interest or that, that, you know, that undermines the integrity of the process, even by creating a question mark as to whether or not it perhaps was influenced by, you know, the fact that you're living at a $50 a night condo in, in a nice neighborhood in Washington, D.C., provided by the, the spouse of the chairman of the lobbying firm. It's that, that appearance alone can cause a problem in terms of uh, the standards of the conduct rules for the federal government. Is that right, Kathleen, that, that appearances themselves, even if no law was violated, which the EPA claims did not happen here, no laws were broken, appearances can be problematic? That's absolutely right. The ethics standards are concerned not just with through the reality, but the appearance of, of a problem, of a conflict. And in fact, the gift rules that were recently uh, revised uh, require federal employees to consider how the situation will appear to the reasonable person with knowledge of the facts. And if those facts would cause a reasonable person to question the integrity of the uh, agency's ethics or that official's ethics, then they should not accept the gift or the discount. Eric, as you reported today, there were other firms that are represented by this lobbying firm who also had business before the EPA, and they did not get any special favors or, or any actions in their favor while Pruitt was renting this room. So is it possible this is just a one-off thing that the timing just looks bad and that there really was nothing uh, afoot here? Yeah, no, we still have no evidence that he intervened or that the lobbying firm asked for him to do any special favors. Uh, it, it, you know, so we, we do not have that evidence. And, and the problem, though, is that, you know, think of like Gina McCarthy, who was the head of the EPA. Say she was living in the Sierra Club's condo, you know, an environmental group, or, you know, at the same time as she was making decisions about coal burning power plants. I mean, there would be, you know, investigations into that. There, even if she did not do any special favors for the Sierra Club. So it just the you know it, it just seems like the optics of that should be obvious to anyone that's in federal government that you should not have a you know a financial tie to the spouse of a, a, a regulated lobbyist. Kathleen, you study governmental ethics and you know the laws about this, but I'm curious as to your take on uh, Pruitt's future in this administration. I mean, he is obviously one of the most uh, durable and popular as far as the president is concerned. He's been very effective instituting the president's agenda. Is your sense that, that this particular issue, as well as some of the travel and other concerns that have been raised about Pruitt, do those dent his future in the administration? What is your sense of that? My sense is that while the president is not exactly um, uh, an advocate of strong ethics standards, he is uh, willing to an abandon an, appoint, an appointee who starts getting into trouble and becomes unpopular. And this, uh, the, the stories in the last few days may be a tipping point for Pruitt. Eric, same question to you. What is your sense? Does this accumulated series of stories about questions about Pruitt's behavior and his ethics are these damaging to his future, or does he, is he still a rock-solid member of the administration? I mean, Pruitt is a superstar for the Trump administration. I mean, the, the clean power plan, the waters of the U.S., the methane rule, the coal, the coal disposal rule. I mean, I could, I could go on and on. The number of rules that he, that just this, you know, the 54.4% uh, mile per gallon standard, he says is going to be up for reconsideration as a 2025 for cars that are supposed to meet. I mean, the automakers were there and uh, posing with him in a photo today. I mean, the industry is embracing him and, and supportive of all the changes he's making. This is just what President Trump wants the EPA to be doing. So, you know, on the one hand, he's creating a distraction and ethics issues that are uncomfortable for the White House. On the other hand, he's perhaps the most aggressive advocate of the deregulatory push that Trump wants. So 
it's going to be a tough decision for them what to do. If things get much worse, then, then it becomes, a, you know, his status becomes more of a question mark. But right now, he continues to lead the charge for the administration on this deregulatory push. All right. Eric Lipton, Kathleen Clark, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. U.S. policy towards Syria has been a hotly argued subject here in Washington ever since the 2011 uprisings turned into a full-blown civil war. That debate continues today. As John Yang reports, President Trump has struck a different tone from one of his top generals, especially around the U.S. contribution to rebuilding territory formerly controlled by ISIS. I want to get out. I want to bring our troops back home. I want to Today, President Trump said that the end is in sight for the U.S. military mission in Syria. It's very costly for our country, and it helps other countries a hell of a lot more than it helps us. We'll be making a decision as to what we do uh, in the very near future. Barely a mile away at a separate event in Washington, the head of U.S. Central Command had his own take on the fight against ISIS and what comes after it. The hard part, I think, is in front of us, and that is stabilizing these areas, consolidating our gains, getting people back into their homes, uh, addressing the long-term uh, uh, issues of reconstruction. U.S. military leaders and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis have said the U.S. should remain in Syria until ISIS is wiped out. But Mr. Trump took the Pentagon by surprise last Thursday with this declaration. We'll be coming out of Syria like very soon. Let the other people take care of it now. Then came reports the administration froze $200 million in recovery funds for areas liberated from ISIS. Some 2,000 American service members are currently on the ground in Syria, the bulk special operations forces. Last week, an American and a British soldier were killed by a roadside bomb. It happened in the northern city of Manbij, near the Turkish border, where a new front in the grinding Syrian conflict is open. With U.S. help, the largely Kurdish Syrian Democratic Forces recaptured Manbij from ISIS in 2016. Last month, Turkey launched an assault on Kurdish forces to the west in Afrin. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, threatened to drive the Kurds from Manbij next. The Turkish operation has pulled Kurdish fighters from battling ISIS remnants in eastern Syria, possibly allowing the militants an opportunity to regroup. U.S. reinforcements arrived in Manbij in recent days, an apparent sign that, for now at least, they will stay as a counterweight to the Turkish moves. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Ankara today for meetings with the leaders of Turkey and Iran. Tomorrow, they'll discuss the future of Syria without the United States. For more on where the United States, its allies and its adversaries stand on the complex battlefield of northern Syria, I'm joined by Mona Yakubian. She was a deputy assistant administrator in the Middle East Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development from 2014 to 2017. And Amber Zaman, a columnist for Al Monitor, an American website that reports on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Welcome to you both. So we had this split screen moment today in Washington, the president uh, speaking and then the uh, General Votel and others speaking uh, where you were. Uh, Mona, let me start with you. Is it clear to you what the American intention is in, in Syria? Well, I think the American intention in Syria has been, first and foremost, to defeat ISIS. Uh, and I don't think that has shifted. I do think, though, that what we saw today playing out almost in real time um, are some of the, the tensions or the challenges that U.S. policy faces with uh, President Trump, who has been fairly clear that he's looking to pull U.S. troops out uh, as soon as possible, while some of his key advisors are really underscoring the battle isn't yet fully won and there's a need to maintain a U.S. presence there. Amber, this meeting in, in Ankara with, with, uh, with uh, Putin, uh, Erdogan, and Rouhani uh, from, uh, from Iran, uh, what is likely to come out or what could come out of this? Well, this is part of an ongoing process known as the Astana process that was la launched uh, last year in May. And the idea was to create what they call de-escalation zones in Syria. And they 
uh, designated for such zones. Uh, and the idea was that uh, there would be ceasefires allowing humanitarian aid to come into these areas and at the same time laying the foundation for uh, a peace. Um, and it's been going on sort of at a rather bumpy pace because the idea of a ceasefire, well, it seems pretty laughable when you consider that the regime is continuing to bomb these so-called des uh, designated zones, de-escalation zones, most recently as we saw in eastern Ghouta. Uh, and so these three leaders will come together and probably be talking about Idlib, which is this province that borders Turkey, which is one of the last remaining rebel strongholds where you have this Al-Qaeda affiliated group known as Hayat al-Tahrir Sham that's uh, there still. And Turkey is expected to use its, revel uh, its leverage over those groups, the, those rebels in that province to try and convince them to stop the fight. So the United States is not participating in these talks that are going on? No, right? no. And the, the, these countries, Iran, uh, Russia, and Turkey, present this not as an alternative to the Geneva peace process that the United States is involved in, and the UN, obviously, but rather as a supplement to that that will help bol bolster that process. And, and Mona, when, when the, you hear these slightly different, sort of difference in emphasis between the president and General Votel, what do the U.S. allies, how do, what, what message do the U.S. allies take from this? Well, I think it's concerning, to certainly to U.S. allies on the ground, namely the Kurds, our primary partner on the ground inside Syria. I think there's a lot of worry about how long will the U.S. stay? Um, are, is the U.S. simply gonna, going to pull out uh, and not be there to help sustain the, and consolidate the, the gains that have been made on the ground and help stabilize the area? And uh, Amber, th there all these parties in the in this uh, on the battlefield all have conflicting and they're different and sometimes conflicting interests. Is Turkey more interested in defeating ISIS or in battling the Kurds? Well, if you were to ask the Kurds, they would say definitely to battle the Kurds. If you were to ask the Turks, they would say both. But the reality is that ever since Turkey gave up on the idea of regime change, realizing that was going nowhere, this campaign uh, to overthrow Assad and empowering the rebels, giving them uh, uh, you know, space in Turkey to operate out of, after they made that shift in 2015, and that followed Russia's intervention very forcefully and decisively, on the side of the regime, they decided that their priority would then become to try and defeat the Kurds there because uh, over that period from 2014 onwards, meanwhile, the United States got involved in this fight against the Islamic State. Uh, Turkey was expected and the rebels were expected to help in that fight but did not prove very effective, which is why the United States then went on to um, increase its um, help to these Kurdish groups because they proved to be extremely effective. The trouble, though, is that these Kurdish groups that the United States is helping are closely linked to another Kurdish group that's fighting inside Turkey. And of course, Turkey is furious uh, that, Tur that the United States is arming uh, the allies of a group that's fighting its own uh, soldiers inside Turkey. And so, um, as we saw in January, they decided to carry matters further and uh, attack this Syrian Kurdish group that's allied with the United States inside Syria. And this has undermined the fight against ISIS. Mona, we have less than 30 seconds left. Very quickly, the president said today that the United States has gotten nothing out of the, uh, their, uh, their, its involvement in the Middle East except death and destruction. What is the U.S. interest in this fight, in, in fighting ISIS in Syria? Well, I think the primary interest is to protect the homeland, to ensure that the, the threat that uh, ISIS posed while it was in the region does not come back to the U.S. Let's not forget 9-11 and the potential for operations planned uh, that could, in fact, target the homeland. Mona Yacoubi and Ember and Zaman, thank you so much. Thank you. Stay with us coming up on the News Hour. Canada's approach to integrating students from foreign countries. The politics behind the rebooted sitcom Roseanne. And a photographer's life work capturing images from the border. 
But first, the United States and Canada have a lot in common. But when it comes to education outcomes, the two are very different. Unlike the U.S., Canada is one of the top performing education systems in the world. It does a good job educating its English language learners. Within three years of arriving in Canada's public schools, children of new immigrants do as well as native-born children. Kavitha Cardoza with our partner, Education Week, looks at Canada's approach for our weekly series, Making the Grade. Andre, what's your product? When 13-year-old Andre Cordero moved from Portugal to Canada, the only English words he knew were hi, bye, and hot dog. Now he's thriving. Andre credits the small class he attends every morning with other English learners. I feel equal. Like, I don't feel like I have much pressure to make a mistake. Triangular prism? Yeah. Excellent. Teacher Anne Wumert brings in props, speaks slowly, and tries to make the lessons meaningful. The visual cues uh, and that opportunity to talk about what we're doing is really important. So they need to see the relevance. How does it connect to my life? Three-fourths of the 500 students at Islington Junior Middle School speak a language other than English at home, including Somali, Korean, and Russian. It mirrors the diversity of Toronto, where almost half the population was born in a different country. Then you will place a wooden plank so that it looks like an inclined plane. Every afternoon, all English learners join regular classes. This intentional integration is meant to help them feel part of the larger school. And if they find the class difficult, their teacher, Wumert, is available to help. So, the work from here to here is how much? Hayam Al-Tarifi came to Canada in 2015 as a refugee from Syria. She hasn't been to school regularly for years, but here, she's quickly catching up. Good. It's a very nice country and very kind, and they don't make you feel that you're different. Oh, that's the third language you want to know, right, French? <laughs> Students here don't just get language and academic support. Through books, posters, and school traditions, their home cultures are celebrated. Teacher Janet McCarroll keeps a tea set handy. Many of my students come from the Middle East. Tea is a very important part of their culture. We invite families to join us, so sometimes mums or dads will come. We'll set up the tables, the kids can serve the tea. It gives them a sense of this is my classroom, this is my space, this teacher respects that this is kind of part of my upbringing. In Canada, newcomers are selected mainly based on their ability to support the economy. They get points for job skills and education. This is unlike the U.S., where immigration is largely based on reuniting families. But Andrea Schleicher, an expert in international education, says while those policy differences do give Canada an edge over U.S. schools, it doesn't fully account for why immigrant children do so well. Wealthy immigrant children in the United States, they will do a lot worse than the same kind of immigrant children in Canada. There's a lot that Canada does to enable those children to achieve similar results. John Malloy is head of Toronto's school system. It's the largest in Canada with almost 250,000 students. And you're an immigrant yourself from the U.S. Yes, I'm an immigrant. I moved here to Toronto in 1991 from Cleveland, Ohio. Malloy says a key difference between the two countries is funding. In the U.S., the amount of money each student receives can vary a lot between school districts because it's based on local property taxes. In Canada, all the money collected from taxpayers is routed through the provincial government, so every student in Ontario gets the same per-pupil funding. And that grant is pretty healthy compared to many other parts of the world that I'm aware of. I have never heard a school leader say the amount per pupil they get is healthy. It's healthy. Schools in Canada also receive extra money for each English learner. Linda Darling-Hammond, a professor at Stanford University, has written extensively about international education systems. She says becoming a teacher in Canada is very competitive. Everyone gets a very high quality of training, which they have been improving and increasing over time, and mentoring is more widely available for teachers. Teacher salaries and jobs are not tied to student test scores. Darling Hammond says what you find in Canada also happens in the U.S., but not systemically. 
not for all kids, not for all teachers, not for all school settings. I think what Canada has shown us is that you can much more equitably provide a high level of education uh, across entire provinces and even across a country. But you're going to bend from your hips and just let yourself Strong hang. community partners and right, outside so social up. services help. Inhale and exhale, come down. In a darkened classroom at a nearby high school, students four, practice breathing. Three, it's two, their lunch break. I feel like I heard a lot of sighs. This class promoting <laughs> mental health is popular. Class, really Aslam Azami from Afghanistan is a senior. All the stress builds up from the subjects, all the, most of the homework tests and uh, exams and then applying for university. Thank you all for coming. You guys can all grab pizza on your way out. Nicole de Souza, who runs the class, says they also make slime and draw posters to de-stress. And not knowing the language and how the school system works. Sometimes parents want something and you want something different and that's the culture around that. But de Souza is not employed by Toronto schools. She works for one of Ontario's many community centres, mostly funded by the government. They support students through mentoring, tutoring and after-school clubs, allowing Canadian teachers to concentrate on teaching. These services are not just for young people. We have every service that a newcomer arriving to Canada will need. and will need. Malini Singh coordinates services at the Neighbourhood Organization. They served almost 22,000 newcomers at this one centre last year through a range of services. Some of the larger things are finding employment, housing, connecting to social services. We also do smaller things like um, teaching parents how to dress your kids for winter. Professor Louis Vellante with Brock University says having a strong safety net is necessary for strong educational outcomes. You can't really divorce education policies from broader social protection and economic policies. Canada has traditionally been welcoming to newcomers in part because they're seen as necessary for the country's economic success. Shoppers at a popular mall downtown overwhelmingly say immigrants make Canada better. Immigrants are the backbone of our country. It makes it Canada a more interesting place. It's easy to see how this positive social climate can help new immigrants thrive. But Canada has not been immune to the growing anti-immigrant sentiment that's been becoming more pervasive in the US and European countries in recent years. It's become like an issue with like controversy and like conflict between people. I think immigration has just such a negative connotation nowadays. But students like Andre Codero are still sheltered in the classroom. His reading and math are improving dramatically as well as his English. That I think I know how to answer some questions now. Andre hopes to be in mainstream classes soon. And while Canada is now home, he still misses friends and family back in Portugal. Maybe I'll buy a house there one day, he says. I can visit during Canadian winters. And Kavitha Gardoza joins me now. Thank you, Kavitha. What an interesting piece. So the U.S. education system, often co compared to other countries, why did you look at Canada? Well, Judy, often we look at countries like Finland, New Zealand, Singapore, and I think it's a little unfair because these countries are either way more homogenous, they were very small, or often they have a different form of government. Like you said earlier, Canada and the US have a lot in common. What made them particularly intriguing is that they have a higher percentage of immigrant students. So about 30% of their school kids have an immigrant background compared to about 20% of ours. And are you saying, I mean, we saw some really interesting successful techniques that this could work in the US? I definitely think we have a lot to learn from them, but I don't want to leave viewers, Judy, with the impression that Canada has all the answers. Because even in Canada, there are variations between provinces, and even within a province, you see a gap. And so um, I definitely don't want to leave people with that impression. But nevertheless, it is so interesting to see what they're doing. Just a little touch, serving tea. Something tiny, but so significant and meaningful. Kavitha Cardoza, thank you. Thank you.
After two decades since it went off the air, Roseanne is back. And its revival was big in its debut with 25 million viewers. The third episode airs tonight on ABC. The show has won acclaim for the way it's dealing with our political polarization after the election. But the comedy and Roseanne Barr herself have also attracted a share of criticism as well. Jeffrey Brown has a look. What's up, deplorable? The Connor family is back, still with a bite. ABC's hit show Roseanne got a modern reboot, and some 25 million people tuned in last week to watch the series premiere. Thank you for making America great again. It's been more than 20 years since audiences heard the wisecracking wit of the blue-collar Connor family matriarch, Roseanne, the character created by comedian Roseanne Barr. She returns with husband Dan, played by John Goodman, sister Jackie, Lori Medcalf, and daughter Darlene, played by Sarah Gilbert, who this time around also serves as the show's executive producer. Are you ever sorry we got married? Every second of my life. The original Roseanne was lauded for its depiction of a struggling working-class American family living in the fictional suburb of Lanford, wow. Illinois. It lasted nine seasons, much of that time as one of the highest rated programs on television, and one of the few sitcoms to grapple with issues of class. The reboot continues that tradition in Donald Trump's America, with Roseanne Connor, a supporter of the president, and sister Jackie, who voted for Hillary Clinton. How could you have voted for him, Roseanne? He talked about jobs, Jackie. He said he'd shake things up. I mean, this might come as a complete shock to you, but we almost lost our house the way things are going. Have you looked at the news? Because now things are worse. Not on the real news. Oh, police! Other issues come up. One of the newest characters, Mark, is Roseanne's gender-bending nine-year-old grandson. You hear that, honey? My grandson's nails are wet. Barr herself is a real-life Trump supporter, and the president embraced the show's success as part of his own. Even look at Roseanne. I called her yesterday. Look at her ratings. Look at her ratings. Barr has also received scrutiny and criticism for her seeming embrace on social media of right-wing conspiracy theories, including one involving a student survivor in the Parkland shooting. Some of her tweets have since been deleted. Roseanne, the TV show, has already been renewed for another season. Joining me now, Sonia Soraya, a TV critic for Variety, and NPR's Eric Deggins. Welcome to both of you. Eric, first, 25 million is a huge number these days. Why do you think the interest, what do you think it's tapping into? I actually felt like a bunch of different trends came together in uh, one huge result. Um, people have been looking at the cities where the show uh, seemed to rate best, and they've noticed that a lot of the cities are in the middle of the country. And I certainly think there was a sense that people tuned in hoping to see a depiction of themselves that they don't often see on television, where people in the middle of the country and people who might be working class are treated with respect and treated as if uh, you know they're they have some sense and yeah. and they're not treated like caricatures. Um, but I also think ABC promoted this show very heavily. Uh, I, I think the show was popular when it was on. It was one of TV's most popular shows when it was on. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so a lot of these trends came together to create a show that was very popular when it, when it aired. Well, Sonia, you, you wrote in your piece, the draw is seeing a show acknowledge that voters who disagree are still people, maybe wrong people, maybe righteous people, maybe confused people, but certainly human beings. So, but it, it's tapping, it's hitting a lot of raw nerves. So what do you see? I mean, you know, I think that when you see Roseanne and, and when you see her family, too, you see that there's one, one woman who's a very outspoken Trump supporter here, and then there's her whole family around her who has different viewpoints, maybe apathetic viewpoints. But, like, frankly, you know, I recognize the Trump voters that I have met and who are in my family in some of the ways in which she is both espousing these beliefs and then also in the ways that she's... Uh, 
uh, not listening to some of the other criticisms that she's hearing. Um, I think that there's something very real about that person, and I think that that we're you know we're all trying to understand who that person is right now. Um, whether or not you're coming from the perspective of like I am a Trump supporter and I want to see what I believe on screen, or if you're someone who has a loved one who's in that you know who who believes those things or who supports this president. Um, it's it's a really important conversation we're having right now, it, and I think it really did strike a nerve. Is it inevitable, Eric, that we want in in our currently political and culturally divisive age? that we watch these things through that lens? And also, this question of separating Roseanne Barr, the person, from Roseanne, the character. Well, I do think what's interesting to me about this show is that it didn't really explore um, the, the roots of why somebody like Roseanne Connor, who when we last saw her, um, you know, was, was uh, supported abortion rights, uh, supported gay rights, uh, you know, to tried to investigate on her own whether she and her husband had unwittingly transmitted racist views to their son when he didn't want to kiss a black girl in a school pageant. How somebody like that came to believe that voting for Donald Trump uh, was a, was a was, was something that made sense when Hillary Clinton seemed to be much more in line with those uh, values, and and I don't think the show really investigated that, and that felt like a lost opportunity when when the show was at its height. Uh, they they spent two episodes looking at uh, how all the characters on that show felt about abortion. Uh, the episode that I talked about with DJ Roseanne's son and racism, they spent a whole episode exploring how he might have come to feel that way and how Roseanne and Dan may have unwittingly contributed to that. But we the discussion that we yeah. saw in 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 this new Roseanne was basically a series of sort of jabs and 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 uh, and insults traded between two characters. Uh, it, it, they didn't take a lot of time to sort of investigate how Roseanne may have come to feel how, the way she felt or how other people in her family may have felt about it. A lot of it was implied. And, and, yeah. and I noticed when I tried to talk to the cast about this and I tried to talk to Roseanne about this back in January that they were a little hesitant to talk about the political implications of what they were doing and why they were making the choices that they were making to well, make Roseanne a Trump supporter in the first place. Well, but let me ask, is that, that, let me ask uh, you, Sonia, because that's a lot to put on a sitcom. You you know, and to, to ask it to answer a lot of questions that we talk about all the time on a program like this as well. Sarah Gilbert, who's the actress and, and now the executive producer, she says the show is not about politics. It's not about anybody's position or policy. It's about what happens to a family when there is a political divide. You know, I, I don't know that you can quite get away with saying it's not about politics because there are a lot of shows on television that portray a lot of different kinds of families and not all of them are dealing with the fact, you know, are, are explicitly making jokes about deplorables or pantsuits or Donald Trump or whatever it is. Um, but I definitely think that politics is a part of a lot of people's families. It's part of a lot of people's family disagreements. And what's important about Roseanne is that it is not just about her the character or her, the actor, and their support of Donald Trump. It's also about the whole family, and it's about how the whole family talks about these things. It's even about how Roseanne's own sister, who is a Hillary supporter, feels bullied by Roseanne um, into making the, a decision that isn't right for her, ultimately, in the ballot, uh, um, in the voting booth. I mean, and more than that, like, it's worth saying, you know, to Eric's point that the Roseanne in the past has dealt with these things a lot more sensitively, we've only seen two episodes episodes, and only one of them really talks about Donald Trump. And now I'm not saying, like, I can't tell the future about what the rest of the season is going to hold, but I think it's important to remember that some of the things, some of the assumptions that we're, that we're making out of the very first episode might be things that yeah. get unpacked more as we go forward. Okay, we'll see, and we'll also see what happens to the ratings going forward. Sonia Soraya, Eric Deggins, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. We close tonight where we began, the border. Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist John Moore has been documenting and photographing life on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico line for the last 10 years. These images, called undocumented, are now a book. A warning, this report contains some graphic images. From the Border Patrol agents to the un undocumented immigrants to immigrants who were in jail um, to gang members in Central America. I photographed them to show a common thread of humanity 
on all sides of this story. I'm John Moore. I'm a senior staff photographer and special correspondent for Getty Images. I've been photographing along the U.S.-Mexico border for almost 10 years. Physically, the border areas all along the 2,000-mile border look very similar on the Mexican and the American sides. Oftentimes, it's a line that was just drawn through the sand. In other places, the border is formed by the Rio Grande. But in other ways, each side is entirely different. Right now in Mexico, in many border areas, the drug war is raging and the violence is incredible. In Acapulco, which is you know, famous for being a tourist site, there I photographed executions on a daily basis. In San Pedro Sula, Honduras, I visited there just this last year. And there I was able to photograph actual uh, assassins um, who do hits for a living. You know, part of the story for me has been trying to show why people will take such risks, um, why people will leave everything behind, whether it's from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, or Mexico. That's where most immigrants come from um, on their journey to the U.S. I traveled to southern Mexico, to the states of Chiapas and Oaxaca, where immigrants would climb aboard freight trains known as the Beast, um, or La Bestia in Spanish. And the train is called the Beast for a reason, because it's a monstrous way to travel. People travel for days, even weeks at a time, on top of the trains, and always in danger of being swept off the top by branches. Many have fallen underneath the wheels and died under the trains or been dismembered. Um, it's, it's just terrifying. And on the U.S. side of the border, I spent many, many hours photographing U.S. border agents as well, doing very difficult work in often dangerous situations. I spent several days this, just this last year at the Border Patrol Academy in Artesia, New Mexico. And there the trainees go through a months-long program, which starts basically as a boot camp, and they learn how to be agents. The Border Patrol draws from people from many walks of life. Uh, there are immigrants as Border Patrol agents. Uh, many Border Patrol agents, if not most, um, speak Spanish as their first language. And those who don't speak Spanish to start with have to learn it uh, at the Border Patrol Academy. As part of this project, I even flew back on deportation flights with a group of immigrants who had been shackled by the ankles and sent back on a plane. There's one picture that still touches me. It's a close-up photograph of two hands, and they're handcuffed together. And a woman was gently caressing a man's hand with her thumb in a very touching and sad moment of comfort. Early on in this story for me, I was covering more of a political issue. But I really wanted to go in uh, much deeper to the root causes of immigration and look at the insecurities that Americans felt about border security. Even though the numbers of families coming across the border has gone down somewhat since uh, President Trump took office, it's still at historical highs. And every day people come across the border seeking political asylum in the U.S. And by U.S. law, um, they're allowed to plead their case. I think as a photojournalist, it's necessary to separate the emotions from the reality as much as I can. I try to photograph the story in as many ways as, as possible to give a true story of a major issue. So powerful, those pictures. And finally, a quick update to our lead story. A shooting attack at YouTube's headquarters in San Bruno, California, wounded at least four people. Police said that the woman, who is believed to be the shooter, died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Investigators are still working to piece together a motive. And that is the News Hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. watching PBS.